So it's hard to exist in the fantasy space without having heard of Fourth Wing. Uh, this is a fantasy romance book that came out early last year, written by Rebecca Yaros. And to say it has been a success is a bit of an understatement, okay? Like, this thing was a juggernaut. It came out of absolutely nowhere. Like, this author was not known for writing fantasy books. She just had a couple of, you know, smaller romance hits. But my god, did this thing explode. So much so that it didn't even take a full year for its sequel to come out. Like, they didn't even wait a year. They were like, yep, Christmas, let's go, let's go. They're also already working on a TV show for it on Amazon Prime. Again, the book hasn't even been out for a year yet. It has well over a million ratings on Goodreads, which is absolutely insane. Some of the most famous books of all time are in that range. And as you can also tell from the Goodreads score, which is astronomically high, people love this thing. Or at least if you exist in certain circles, that might be the impression you get. But in other circles, they paint a bit of a different picture. In fact, I don't know if I've seen a book that on YouTube has gotten this much negativity. Countless, countless booktubers have made deep dives into Fourth Wing, sometimes feature-length deep dives, into just how terrible this book is. And I have not watched any of them, because this face value discourse that I've been seeing really intrigued me. I was really interested in why this book uh, was creating such a polarized reaction. And I got together with my buddy Apollo, who is now over at the Inkwell, you can check out his channel, and we decided to do a buddy read of Fourth Wing. To get to the bottom of why this book is so popular, and which side of the argument is right. Real shocker for you, uh, the haters are, this is atrocious. <laughs> but let's get into, let's get into why I thought so, and why, uh, you know, if you have similar tastes to me, you might want to skip this one. <laughs> Also, we're doing full spoilers here, I, who, who cares? So the book takes place at Dragon School. It follows Violet, who uh, is attending Dragon School to become a, a dragon rider. Her mom is like the lead commander, so she's sort of famous, and a lot of people want to kill her. One of them is Zayden, who's like the bad boy. Oh, he's so, so mysterious and bad. And her childhood friend, Dane, is like... Violet, stay away from him. He's bad news. If you're looking for a good wholesome boy who follows the rules, I'm right here. But she's like, nah, man, I want this bad boy. You know, he wants to kill me. I'm here dodging assassins left and right. But yeah, he's the one. Her sister's like, man, Violet, I really don't like how you're going to dragon school. It's so dangerous. Like, everyone gets killed in dragon school. But while you're there, make sure you're getting some good dick. Am I right? Am I right? And so the book pretty much follows Violet as she attends her classes and her activities while she is, you know, slobbering over Zayden. Eventually she gets to the point where she bonds with a dragon, which is like what all the riders do, and it gives them special powers. But because Violet does not like the other girls, she actually bonds with a second dragon, a baby dragon, who's like a special type of dragon that people didn't, didn't even know existed. So now she's got like two dragons that are like living inside of her head. So she's going about her day, like Zayden will walk by without his shirt and she'll like go a wooga and her like, like her eyes will pop out of her head and tongue fall out. And the older dragon's in her head like, oh, these frivolous distractions, you must focus, or else it will be your doom. And her childhood friend is like, no, no, don't, he's, he's such a meanie, he's such, he's such a bad boy. And Violet's like, I, I don't care, I want to mount him like I mount my dragon. And the baby dragon in her head is like, eh, I'm, a, I'm a baby, I, I made a poopy man. I haven't really given much other context to this book, like this world they're in, this school they go to, what's the socio-political situation here. It doesn't really matter, because the world building in this thing is rough, <laughs> to say the least. I I read the whole thing, I, I don't really know what's happening here. The world building is so basic, so, like, bare minimum, and the way it is presented to us as the readers is so lazy. Like, in typical magic school stories, you know, they sort of work to flesh out the world as we follow these characters, you know, attending these classes. They'll go to one and they'll, like, explain this new concept and get into backstory and stuff, and, you know, it works to flesh out the world, flesh out the story in a natural way. That doesn't really happen here. They just sort of, like, go around fighting each other, so the exposition often comes in these really awkward scenes, like, near the start of the book, where Violet is, like, doing this test to get into the school, and at one point she's, like, very nervous, so what she does to calm her herself down is just shout facts 
about the world. <laughs> that doesn't really matter because, as I mentioned, this is a romance fantasy book. And uh, the romance is more so the focus here. As she is very thirsty for Zayden, uh, as we find out later, Zayden is very thirsty for her, and Dane is just extremely jealous. Uh, you know, the classic love triangle setup, and it's about as bad as it gets. Like, these characters are so one note, and there's just so much teasing and waiting for stuff to happen and stuff that's being repeated. Like, Violet and Zayden, it's like the classic enemies to lovers trope, but like, at the same time, they were never really enemies, because Zayden was sort of always after her. Like, they make it seem like he wants to kill her, but it is still very obvious from, like, the first time they interact that that's not how this is going. But anyway, like, the, the big dragon that Violet bonded, turns out that that dragon is Zayden's dragon's mate. And you see, dragons need to be with their mate or else they will die or something. So now Violet and Zayden are basically forced to spend time with each other, which of course they act annoyed about, but, but are not. Just the writing around these characters and the dialogue, like it's all brutal, man. It's, it's so comically awful. A lot of these videos that I mentioned will have like quotes from the book in the thumbnail, because oftentimes that's all you really need to see. To, to know what type of book this is. This really does feel like a YA book, sometimes even middle grade, but they're just constantly throwing in swear words and like talk about sex. <laughs> it's like what a 13 year old would think an adult book <laughs> reads like. And in this instance, it, it is what it reads like. There's one line that literally made me physically gag. <laughs> and it, it happens when so like Violet's like one of her dragon powers. Uh, is that she can command lightning. And when she first unlocks it, Zayden is like, ah, lightning, I knew it. And after like some passionate lovemaking, uh, she asks him, she's like, H how did you know? And he says, baby, I've known from the first time our lips touched. <sighs> so yeah, this is a smut book. <laughs> If, if that wasn't obvious. Being bonded with the dragons of each other's mates, like, sort of overpowers their sex drives. Um, so, you know, they, they go a bit feral with each other. Lightning is shooting out of her, uh, shadows are shooting out of Zayden, because that's, like, his dragon power. Get it? He's, like, the bad boy, and he controls the shadows, and she is the good girl, and she controls light. And now, surprisingly, there's not all that much of that in this book. Yeah, like, sure, there's a lot of thirst and, like, horniness, but the actual sex scenes don't happen until, like, the last quarter of the book. And, you know, if you've read Smut before, it's about what you would expect. They're very comical in just how descriptive and over-the-top everything is. Yaros has a very interesting obsession with tongues, let me tell you. My goodness. Though here it really feels like a, a, someone else took over writing these scenes, because it's almost like uh, Rebecca Yarrow has just unlocked a new, like, set of dialogue here. <laughs> and it's just kind of jarring how, like, explicit it gets when most of the book is, like, PG-13. <laughs> so yes, I would say this is the focus of the book. This is, like, the main thing it's one wants to get across, you know, this stupid love triangle and, you know, all the sexual tension. But it is still trying to tell a, you know, serious fantasy story. And as bad as the romance stuff is, it's really, you know, this part of the book uh, where it fails in pretty much every aspect. As I already mentioned, there's almost nothing to the world building. And as for the actual, like, plot of the thing here, it feels so derivative of so many other books I have read before. Like, if you have read The Hunger Games and Divergent, you could probably guess this entire plot, to the point where some parts of this book almost feel like plagiarism. The cliches it employs are just so tired, like, my god. Her brother, who they keep mentioning, everyone knows her brother and talks about her brother, well, he died before the series started. Well, obviously he's not dead. Keep talking about all the, these traitors, these griffin riders. Oh, they're so bad and evil and they, they're betraying their country. Well, obviously they're the good guys. Obviously the government of our, you know, dragon school world here, you know, has some secrets. Wouldn't it be crazy if her brother, the one that died, is actually the leader of these rebels? <laughs> the stakes of the book also just feel so lazy. Because, like, we're in a world here where characters can die at any moment. In fact, Yaros loves killing off characters. 
So many children die. I say children, they're like 20. So many young people die in this book. A dragon sneezes and incinerates like five people. They go for a dragon flight and like seven people just casually fall off to their doom. And every morning they like read off a list of the fallen. Now this does sound very somber and dark, but uh, you can never really tell from the way it's written. There's a manga called Dead Rock, um, which is not very good, uh, but it's very entertaining. And it's like a similar thing where they're in this magic school and students are just getting killed off like crazy. But you see, I think that series is at least self-aware enough to know how ridiculous it is and sort of plays them off as jokes sometimes. Fourth Wing never does that. Like, it always uses this as an excuse to be like, oh my god, everyone's dying, it's so dangerous. But our main characters aren't dying, they're always fine. But it never feels like there's any real danger, all of these characters are just like showing up, getting introduced, and then immediately dying. Who cares? It's funny though, I think Rebecca Yaros was almost self-aware about how ridiculous this was, because there's one point where Violet actually brings it up, you know, they're reading off these names and she's like, you know, it's a little bit weird how people don't really seem to take this seriously. Like, these were our peers, our classmates, and now they are gone. And then in the literal next sentence, like, Zayden walks in without a shirt and she's like, Whoa! And she forgets all about the people who have died. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the book is pretty much nonsense for, for most of it, although they do uh, tr try to go for a pretty climactic ending here. It's revealed that Zayden and his friends, um, you know, are actually, you know, part of the rebels, part of the Griffin Riders, and Violet feels, like, extremely betrayed by this, because, you know, she's bought into all the propaganda her whole life. She's like, oh my god, Zayden, the man I love, what have I done, what have I done? Like, her entire world is shaken here, but she gets over it extremely quickly. And then out of nowhere, you have like these zombie creatures. They're not like undead. They're like these evil guys, this, this race of, of evil people. And they ride wyverns. Um, and like, they just show up out of nowhere and they're like, oh yeah, Violet, by the way, these guys are real. Um, the wyverns are real. I know you were told they were bedtime stories. Uh, but they're real, and there is a giant army of them right now, and we have to fight them. So yeah, that happens. Um, like one of the, one of the important characters dies. Okay, I'll I'll give it that. I didn't really. Bro, bro, Liam. I haven't really mentioned any of the other characters because they're so nothing, but Liam's a bit of a goofball. I'll give him that. Like, Zayden assigns him as Violet's bodyguard, and he just, like, is always with her. And at nighttime, he, like, sleeps on the floor outside of her room. <laughs> And, like, that's all there is to his character, but he has, like, this huge emotional death scene. Uh, it, it was pretty funny, honestly. Du dude's just chilling, doing this thing. R.I.P. You know, Violet gets knocked out, she gets saved by the rebels, and then her brother is there. It's like, I'm alive! Let's- welcome to the revolution. Kill me. So, yeah, not, uh, not particularly fond of this one, if- if you couldn't tell. I ended up giving it a one star. Not the worst thing I've ever read. Kinda close, though. <laughs> like, the one thing I will give this book, it was pretty fast-paced. I was never really bored during it, and there is definitely a few elements of So Bad It's Good to this one. But only a few, because a lot of it was indeed insufferable. But that begs the question, what, what's up with this? Why is this book so gargantuanly popular? Why is it so beloved? I really think it does come down to, you know, the, the demographics here. You know, a lot of fantasy readers, like you and I, are not necessarily the target demographic for the newly coined romanticy genre. You know, these often go for readers of romance, of YA stuff, who are sort of transitioning to adult stuff. People who live for the tropes, they live for the cringe. And I think that's where we're seeing this big discrepancy. You know, a lot of these issues that I have, many others have with the book, some people don't see as issues, they see as part of the charm. And I don't really have an issue with that, you know, if people want to go on and call this their favorite read of 2023, and the, read the sequels, and the movie, and like all that stuff. I mean, yeah, g go for it, I guess. <laughs> like, it's really just cheesy love triangle bullshit. Uh, like, the issue is that it, it is attempting to still be a serious fantasy story, and for, you know, avid fantasy readers like myself or you, we have different values, different things that we think make up a good fantasy book and this book does not have any of them. So I do kind of understand why there is this giant divide, 
That being said, this book is still so bad. Like, I, okay, I don't read a ton of romanticy stuff, but like, is this really like the best you got? <laughs> like, this is the peak. This is the zenith of your genre. So that's all I had to say. You know, check check this one out if you're curious. I guess maybe you'll end up liking it. But if you do have similar tastes to me, I I think it might be best. <laughs> It might be best to avoid. I'm definitely not going to be reading the sequel, though I actually did look up the plot of the sequel. Bro. Like, I'm afraid if I ever read that book, it will become the worst thing I have ever read. So I'm just not going to. So with that, thank you all so much for watching. You can leave your thoughts on Fourth Wing or the phenomena behind Fourth Wing uh, down in the comments below. And I'll see you next time to talk about a good book.